wanting to have more control. He would wake them girls up in the middle of the night waving a gun. You need to be very scared. I don't care. He'll have to kill me first. You're a devil. Please, Bobby, if anyone's inside, make yourself known. <laughs> Dads are supposed to protect their daughters. They are supposed to do anything in their power to keep them safe, healthy, and happy. They should be willing to put themselves in harm's way if it means keeping their daughters from danger. But unfortunately, not all dads are like this. Some dads, as horrific as it may be, have killed their daughters. They have taken a life that they helped to create. It's almost unimaginable how deranged and sick you would have to be to do something like this to your own child. The following stories tell the tale of three evil dads who killed their daughters. We have a creepy father who sexualized his own daughters, a father who is willing to annihilate his entire family for the sake of starting his life over, and a man who desired control over his daughter that he took her own life. The Saeed sisters apparently became the innocent victims of a tragic culture clash. The practice of arranged marriage has been around for many years and is still used by some cultures today. For many people, this practice may seem unfair and even unethical, but for others, it's something that they grew up with and expect. It involves men fighting for a certain girl they wish to marry by bidding. The father will typically choose the highest bidder. These girls are Amina and Sarah Said. They were fun and loving little girls who had a brother named Islam. Sarah was more of the tomboy, really reserved. Amina was more of a social butterfly. She was very outspoken. She was very tomboyish too, but she also had that pretty cheek side to her. The girls grew into normal teenagers. As you can see from this home video taken by Amina in which she gives a tour of her bedroom. This is my room. Well, mostly mine. It's partly Sarah's. These beautiful girls were friends. They were well-liked at school and made great grades. In fact, a lot of the time, school was all they talked about. They knew they needed to make good grades so that they could have the future of their dreams. Jason Moreno was Amina's boyfriend. He recalled the sisters' high hopes for their futures. They had plans for themselves, you know, that both Amin and Sarah definitely had future plans. Sarah didn't really talk too much. She was very academic. That's all she really ever talked about, that she was always talking about school. Amina planned on having a successful career as a doctor where she would be able to help others. Despite their plans, the girls knew that their family life might complicate things. Their parents were very different people. Their mother was a Southern Baptist but their father, Yasser, was Muslim, who made sure that his family followed the traditions of old Egypt. Shockingly, the girl's mother, Patricia, was just 15 when she married Yasser, who was much older than her. When I found out she was getting married, I, I had a little tantrum, you know. You know, I told her, well, you're running your life, you're too young. Patricia would later admit that she had a reason for getting married at such a young age. I don't think it was love. I think it was just, we were so poor, I just wanted to get out of the house. You know, he like promised everything. Oh, everything, you know, your life is gonna be better. He had a lot of land, he had all this stuff in Egypt. Yasser had also promised Patricia that he would be able to help support her family. From the very beginning of the couple's marriage, things weren't too bad. Yasser was loving and treated Patricia with respect. But after about a year, they began to have trouble. Yasser, who was working as a taxi driver at the time, wasn't following through with the life that he had promised Patricia. He often didn't go to work, forcing Patricia to take on their financial burden by working excessively. Not only this, but he started treating her poorly. He just like started wanting to have more control, did not want me to have anything to do with my family those Americans and the Americans wasn't very good. Despite living in America, Yasser hates anything having to do with Americans. Eventually, he began to hate Patricia and told her that it was a mistake that he married her. He 
He was terribly abusive towards her and would do things like hit her or f her. Sometimes he would take all of her clothing from her dresser, dump it out on the floor, and make her clean it up while he watched. As if this alone did not make Yasser a terrible enough husband, he was also cheating on his wife. He had six affairs that I know of. He would even make Patricia pose for horrific pictures where he held a knife to her throat as a way of showing his power over her. Yasser wasn't just abusive towards Patricia, but to his own daughter. Well, look at his eyes. He can be heard telling his young daughter in this disturbing home video. It was only a matter of time before the evil that was taking place in the said family household bubbled over and exploded. You can hear it play out in this horrific 911 call. Apparently there were a lot of signs that something like this was going to happen. Yasser would frequently use his gun to terrorize the girls and get them to do what he wanted. He would wake them girls up in the middle of the night waving a gun, threatening them that they were gonna do what he says or he was killing them. Yasser was both physically and sexually abusive to the young girls something that Amina would confide in to friends and family members. He would hit them, kick them, he would call them horrible names. After learning of this sexual abuse, Patricia took her children and moved out of the house. They went to the police where the girls detailed how they had been abused. Strangely, they ended up taking back their statements. Ultimately, the charges against Yasser were dropped. Amina would later confess to family members that her parents had forced them to say that, and they had made it all up. Yasser and her made the kids recant their story and say that it didn't happen to keep him out of jail. Yasser could now do whatever he wanted to the girls, including abusing them sexually. It got to the point where they would sleep with jeans on in order to make it harder for him to take advantage of them. Don't even think about it, says one of the girls laying in bed with her pants on. And it gets even creepier as the video goes on and Yasser can be heard complimenting his young daughter's body. Nice legs. Zooming in on his daughter's bare feet, sticking out from under the blanket. The girls are clearly uncomfortable and try to cover up their bodies as best they can. The girls, even though they were young, still knew that what was going on was very wrong. Get out! I'm erasing this tape! No, you can't. Yes, I will. Oh. This is illegal. Do I have to tip you when you're sleeping? And then, after Yasser made a creepy remark about Amina's eyes, she responded, I'm gonna get sick now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, turn it off, Dad. Before the girls were even old enough to know what their plans were for college, Yasser was obsessed with getting arranged marriages set up for them. He even took Amina over to Egypt with him, where he tried to set her up with a 47-year-old man. Amina refused. What Yasser didn't know was that Amina had a boyfriend that she was keeping a secret. Amina told her boyfriend about her father's plans to force her into an arranged marriage. His mother, Ruth, would later learn of what was going on. She told my son that her father had plans for both girls once they graduated to be um, in a forced marriage. And that's why they were going to Egypt during the summers because he was introducing her to men that are, I guess, potential suitors. But an arranged marriage was not what Sarah nor Amina were interested in. They wanted to grow up, go to school, fall in love, and then get married when the time was right. And they were married. They longed to be treated like their brother Islam, who was not subjected to the same control that they were. Yes, sir. Uh treated Islam a lot different from what I've been told. The boys in the Muslim family are very uh, respected. Yasser obsessively kept watch over the girls, even using cameras and telescopes to spy on them in order to make sure they weren't talking to guys and were behaving as he desired. As they got older, I believe that, you know, as kids get older, you start to lose a little bit of that control, and I don't think he liked that. Yasser was totally obsessed with knowing what his girls were doing and who they were talking to at all times. He would bug their computers and cell phones to find out who they were talking to and whether the person was male or female. 
He started to get even more crazy when the girls took part-time jobs at a local store. In this video, you can see Sarah working as a clerk at a grocery store while Yasser videotapes her from afar. He brought Amina along with them. She smiled to the customers. Bella, she has to, part of her job. She's in trouble. It didn't matter what the girls were doing or where it was, their father was always watching. As you can probably imagine, it would only be a matter of time before Yasser would find out that Amina had a boyfriend, that she had been hiding from him. This was a man who treated her right and gave her the respect that she had never received before. We both felt like what we had was very real and it was very, very much worth fighting for. It was much like the story of Romeo and Juliet. Amina knew that her love for her boyfriend might result in her death at the hands of her father, but she refused to give it up. To her, it was worth dying for. And unfortunately, that she did. While Amina and Sarah were in their father's taxi cab, he shot them both in a fit of rage after having learned of Amina's romance. It was hard to say the least. Joseph and Amina first met through a martial arts class. They saw each other nearly every day. They went from liking each other a lot to loving one another. And before long, they had been keeping their relationship under wraps from her father for four years. Meanwhile, Joseph's family knew Amina well. His mother in particular loved her very much. First of all, she was strikingly beautiful. She had these amazing, beautiful green eyes and a smile. I mean, to know her was just to fall in love with her. Amina lived in constant fear of her father finding out about Joseph. She had to save his number under a different name in her phone and would sometimes even have to use a secret phone to contact him. She believed that not only her father, but some of her extended family members could possibly harm Joseph and his family if they found out about her relationship. She showed a picture of her family to his mother to help her to know who to be on the lookout for. She said, if you ever see any of these people around your house or around you or Joseph, you need to be very scared and you need to try to get to the police. Joseph was so desperate to make sure that Amina was safe and get her out of her toxic home life that he began to plan for them to elope. It would be one quick trip to Vegas, they would get married, and everything would be solved. Unfortunately, they would never get to make that trip. That was because Yasser caught Amina in the middle of writing her boyfriend a love letter. Yasser began beating his daughter savagely, demanding that she tell him who Joseph was and where he lived, but she refused. She knew that if she did, her father would kill her boyfriend. In a desperate attempt to make sure that his daughter never spoke to Joseph again, Yasser would abruptly end up moving his entire family to a new town 20 miles away. She was just gone, and, and I, had, I had no idea like what happened. She literally just, from, I went from talking to her hours a day, every day, to just nothing. She, just, she was just gone. Around the time that Yasser had moved and his family away after finding out about Amina's relationship, Amina knew that she was probably going to die. She even considered taking her own life before her father could do it. I don't care. He'll have to kill me first. I'd rather die than live without you. One day, we'll be married and happy. Amina was disgusted by her father's plans for her and her sister. She knew that he was planning on selling both of them against their will in Egypt. And he's gonna take me over there and let some guy choose me like I'm a freaking object. Eventually, the girls and even their mother, Patricia, decided that enough was enough. They ended up getting into the car and fleeing to Oklahoma. It wasn't until they got there that Amina phoned Joseph to tell him what was going on. Meanwhile, Yasser realized that the girls had fled pretty quickly and ended up pinging their phones to determine their location. He blew up Patricia's phone with calls and texts, begging her to come back home. By the time the holiday season rolled around, Patricia convinced her girls to return back home to Texas to visit some of their family members. What they didn't realize until it was too late was that she was bringing them back to their father. Jojo, mom tricked us. She went back. I'm so scared. Amina wrote to Joseph in a text message. When the girls get back home, their father persuades them to get into his taxi cab. He claims that he just wants to take them out to dinner. We know that his intentions were much more sinister. What's going on, man? 
I'm dying, not whatever. Sarah was shot multiple times and still managed to call 911 during that tragic taxi ride before she and Amina both succumbed to their injuries. Sarah and Amina were killed in 2008, but Yasser would not be captured until August of 2020. He was on the FBI's most wanted list for an extended period of time, and a $100,000 reward was posted for information regarding his arrest. He was charged with his daughter's murders, which he pled not guilty to. The case went to trial, and the jury did not believe Yasser's plea of innocence. A jury handed down a guilty verdict to the father who murdered his two teenage daughters and then spent more than a decade on the run. It took three hours for the jury to reach their decision. When the verdict was finally read and Yasser was sentenced to life in prison, he showed no emotion. Patricia took the stand upon Yasser's sentencing to get the final word, not only for herself but for her daughters. She held up two photographs, one of Amina and one of Sarah, during her statement. Yasser Saeed. You're a devil. You murdered your girls. And I'm gonna say this. I hope somebody gets their hands on you and hurt you and do everything you ever done to anybody. For now, Yasser remains behind bars. May Sarah and Amina's bright and beautiful souls be remembered forever. Like, I have no inclination to where they're at right now. It's like a nightmare that I just can't wake up from. Like, I want her back so bad. I want those kids back so bad. Said Chris Watts, a strange smile upon his face as he spoke to a local Colorado news station imploring the public for help in finding his beloved wife and children. This is the story of one of the most famous and horrific family members that the world has ever known. It is the disturbing and demonic story of the Watts family murders. Shannon Watts believed that she had a near to perfect life. She loves to document her life on Facebook. Hey guys, we're here from the boat today. She said in one post, smiling ear to ear, her beloved husband, Chris, could be seen following behind her. Shannon was very much beloved by her parents, Frank and Sandra. She was fun, full of life. She did so many things. She had her hand in everything. She was amazing. Because social media was part of her career, Shannon shared a lot of her personal life online. For the most part, she only shared the good parts, herself cooking, parenting her children, and sometimes doing her skincare. She had two adorable little girls, Cece and Bella. She was married to a man named Chris Watts. Chris worked at a local oil plant and had met Shannon through Facebook. I got a friend request from Chris on Facebook. Well, one thing led to another and he's the best thing that has ever happened to me. Shannon absolutely believed that Chris was the man of her dreams. He treated her well and was conscious of the fact that she suffered from a sometimes debilitating disease called lupus. Her family truly believed that she had been sent to him by God. Eventually, when the girls were still quite young, Shannon found out she was pregnant with a third child. She ended up confiding in her online friends regarding her pregnancy. I got a doctor appointment in uh, two hours. I know, boy, boy, Chris wants a boy. I hope it's a boy for him. It'll make him happy. And sure enough, she was pregnant with a boy. As soon as she found out, she decided on a name for the little guy, Nico, a tribute to her Italian heritage. From any of the pictures and videos that Shannon had posted online, Chris appears to be a great dad. He reads to the children, helps her prepare meals, and much more. She had no idea who she really married. Shannon's journey for physical wellness and relief from lupus, a disease she had long suffered with, pushed her to continue her passion for her career, which involved selling health products, including vitamin-infused patches. I'm very determined and I am going to be extremely successful. Shannon would work for many hours a day, and as a result, she got treated to lots of fun vacations around the country. Most of the time she would bring Chris and he got to join her for many cool experiences. Chris Watts appeared to be quite knowledgeable in how relationships were meant to go. 
Here you see him doing an actual tutorial on how to have a relationship. But was he really as good of a partner and father that he seemed on the outside? It was around six years after Chris filmed that tutorial that he met a woman named Nicole Kessinger and began an affair with her. The pair worked together and initially Nicole was under the impression that Chris was single. Meanwhile, while this affair is going on, Shannon remains dedicated to her life with Chris. She's excited for the new addition in their family, baby Nico. She was very excited to tell Chris about her pregnancy, as you can see in this clip, as she wears a t-shirt with the words, oops, we did it again. But Chris didn't want another baby, and he didn't want the responsibility of having a family. That's what attracted him to Nicole she wasn't tied down. While Shannon carried the couple's newborn baby, Nicole and Chris were out having adventures of their own, taking hikes and visiting waterfalls. Chris had longed for these adventures after having gotten tired of the monotony of taking care of his family. Chris and Nicole communicate nonstop. He even texts her when he's at home with Shannon and the girls. Shannon knows that something is going on, but she doesn't know that it's infidelity. Chris seems disinterested in her and disconnected. She thinks that if she gives Chris some space, that it'll help fix their relationship. So she takes the girls to go spend the summer in a different state with her parents. Now that Shannon is miles away, Chris starts dating Nicole out in the open. He doesn't have to sneak around anymore. He can take her out for dates. He's fully invested in their relationship. He's incredibly attracted to her and even takes pictures of her scantily clad in a bikini, which he saves on his phone. He doesn't give a second thought to Shannon, Bella, or Cece. Daddy, daddy, I love you. Chris is totally infatuated with Nicole, even addicted, you might say. He even Googles things like, What does it feel like when someone says, I love you? Meanwhile, in North Carolina with the girls, Shannon is starting to suspect that something is going on back home. Chris takes forever to respond to her text messages, if he even responds at all. You okay? It's like you don't want to talk. I keep trying to talk and I had to dig it out of you. Chris assures her that everything is fine and he's just been busy with work. In another heartbreaking text sent July 10th of 2019, Shannon wrote, I miss you. I wish my husband would talk to me. When Shannon and the girls do end up coming back home, she hopes that things will go back to normal and Chris will be the attentive and affectionate dad again like he used to be. But things are even worse than before and he only ignores her. Five weeks away from me and not touching me. Doesn't make me feel good. He got me pregnant. I just want to cry, she writes in a message to a friend. Even worse, Chris seems totally uninterested in the fact that they're having another child. Shannon tried to fix things and was still invested in her marriage. She wanted to try couples counseling to work through their problems, but Chris wasn't open to this. Then came August of 2018. Shannon had to leave to go on a trip for work. It was decided that she would go with just her friend, Nicole, while Chris and the girls stayed home. After they returned from their trip, Nicole ended up dropping Shannon off at home at around 1.45 in the morning. What Nicole didn't realize was, at the time, this would be the last she would ever hear from her best friend. I just told her, if you need help in the morning, let me know. She had said this because she knew Shannon had a doctor's appointment in the morning that was for her unborn son. The two women shared a hug before going their separate ways, and Nicole returned to her home down the street. It wasn't until the next morning that Nicole had a feeling that something was wrong. Shannon wasn't answering calls or text messages. She wouldn't come to the door, even though Nicole could see the car was still there. In a panic, she called 911, and the officers came out to the house. They ended up making entry into the home. Police department, if anyone's inside, make yourself known. A short while later, Chris arrives at the home. He claims he doesn't know where his wife or girls could have gone. They walk through the house and find things that Shannon wouldn't have left behind, like her cell phone and the girls' blankets. They end up going to a neighbor's house. The neighbor has a security camera that shows the Watts house. It doesn't show her leaving with the girls, but it does show him backing out the truck the night before. People around the nation are tuning into this investigation desperate to bring this pregnant mother and her children home. 
Chris says he wants his girls home, but he shows no emotion. He doesn't cry or even seem worried. It doesn't, if it's earth shattering, I don't feel like this is even real right now. Police bring Chris in for questioning. They know a lot more than he would have expected. They know about his affair with Nicole. He claims he never cheated on his wife, but investigators don't believe it for a minute. I think that sounds ridiculous. Chris also promises that he would never have hurt his family. This is another thing police don't buy. Nothing you told me tonight makes sense. It takes hours of questioning and getting through Chris's lies to try to get through the truth. Now, the issue right now is what happened to Shanann, Bella, and Celeste. Finally, Chris admits that he did in fact kill his wife and children, and he tells police where he buried them. Police follow Chris's instructions and manage to recover the bodies of Shannon, Bella, and Celeste at his job site. He's arrested and charged with their murders. He was found guilty and sentenced to five life sentences without the possibility of parole. His case sent shockwaves around the entire nation. These kids who looked up to you and expected you to be their daddy, like, that's the ultimate betrayal of trust. Shannon, her unborn son, and her daughters were laid to rest together. Tonight, Joshua Burgess sits on close watch in a jail cell here at the Union County Jail. He is charged with murder in a case that investigators describe as chilling. The girl in this picture is beautiful Zaria Burgess, a 15-year-old with her whole life ahead of her. This is just a case where it's just pure evil. Zaria's young life was cut short in 2019 during a visit to her dad's house. She died at the hands of her own father, the man in this photo. Still can't believe what happened, you know? But Zaria wasn't just murdered. She was horrifically tortured Sexually abused and psychologically abused for almost 24 hours by her father. He then hit her throat. The horrific scene played out in this house in North Carolina. Later, Joshua would confess all the awful things he did to poor defenseless Zaria. He, you know, readily admitted uh, what had transpired. Joshua ended up walking into the sheriff's office and giving them his name. They only begin to look him up in their system to find out what he was charged with, only for him to stop them. He stopped her and said, you're not going to find anything. I've just killed someone. Joshua then led police to where it all went down. Nearby neighbors were shocked. They would never have expected something like that to happen in their town, much less that Joshua would be the one to do it. Just crazy and you know how sad and tragic that is. Saria's death devastated her family and friends. She was just the type of kid that would come in the room or come in the house and say, hey everybody, you know, just wanting to make everybody know. Saria never had the chance to attend high school because she was killed just weeks before her freshman year. But she was so young and nobody deserves to leave this world like that, especially by someone they thought that was going to protect them and be there for them. Joshua reportedly showed little emotion during his first appearance in court. And in court, Burgess kept his head very low. It was hard to see his facial expressions. He made very little eye contact. It's unclear where Joshua ever felt remorse for the horrific, unthinkable things he did to young Zaria. You're probably wondering why. Why would someone do this to someone he supposedly loved? As for Joshua's motive, police believe it was fueled by lust towards his daughter and a need to control her. In June of 2020, Joshua would finally have to pay for what he did to his young daughter. After a three-week trial, the jury would ultimately sentence him to death. He remains on death row. May Zaria's beautiful light be remembered forever.